welcome to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in true crime and even the best grandfather clocks, as you can see behind Steve Peterson. We don't mess around here. And uh, we are staying on a story that is now going into its second week, which you never want to hear, uh, especially when it comes to um, missing women and missing women, two missing women, two moms seemingly vanishing into thin air at the same exact time. Uh, we are, just so you know, supposed to be joined potentially by Laura Engel. Uh, she is a crime reporter with News Nation. I work with her at Fox News. Uh, she's actually in Oklahoma right now. I've been talking to her all day. And uh, she was in um, uh, at the OSBI office today trying to get information and told me that uh, for the time being, there are no current updates. Uh, you also last week met Dr. Michaela Samarosing. She owns the largest PI firm in um, the state of Oklahoma, and she should be hopping on uh, as well uh, shortly. And if neither do, for whatever reason, don't worry, you're in good hands because these two have been investigating crimes for uh, the better part of their lives. So without further ado, uh, as I mentioned, Laura Engel should be joining. Uh, she is the crime reporter for News Nation. And Jennifer Koffendoffer, a friend of the show, 28 years in federal law enforcement, uh, many of those years with the FBI, specializing in organized crime and violent crime. Currently, she's an expert witness for Eagle Security Group and a News Nation contributor. Uh, so she works closely with Laura in that regard. And she has a new podcast out, a new true crime podcast called Break the Case with Jennifer Koffendoffer, FBI. Break the Case with Jennifer Koffendoffer, FBI. Please check it out. Please subscribe to her on YouTube. Give it a listen on the audio platforms. And uh, God bless the Missing Mamas is right. Steve Peterson, he's got that funny Boston accent, but he's been living in South Carolina for the better part of 40 years. He is... Uh, was a senior special agent and SSA of the DEA, of the Drug Enforcement Agency. So many acronyms, it's tough to keep up with. Uh, <laughs> when he retired, he was the longest serving street agent at the DEA. And uh, he infamously, or famously, I guess, busted the real Walter White from Breaking Bad. So uh, that is his brush with fame outside of being on STS, of course. And then last but not least, if she gets here again, Dr. Michaela Samarosing, who owns the largest PI firm uh, in Oklahoma. So um, Jennifer Koffendoffer, you know, I follow you closely on Twitter and Instagram, but particularly on Twitter. And this is a troubling case. These two women, they're, they're moms. Uh, one is helping another with a supervised visitation last weekend. And they stop basically three miles from their destination and vanish. Um, what do you make of this case so far? Well, I definitely, um, the word vanish is what I don't believe happened from the standpoint of somebody did something to them. We know this to be a fact because uh, the Oklahoma State uh, Bureau of Investigation who have taken over the case have specifically said uh, that there was evidence of foul play inside the car. And there's been numerous reports that said inside as opposed to outside. Uh, that is cop speech for blood, likely. I've also read reports that there were, uh, you know, possibly a bloody hammer. I don't have that confirmed, but what we do know is there was evidence found there. So unfortunately, uh, they vanished, I believe, at the hands of another so I, I was just going to ask you about that and I'll, I'll follow up. You know, they're using the phrase suspicious disappearance and foul play uh, sort of interchangeably here. And uh, we had Phil Waters on, who was America's most respected detective 
uh, investigated over 400 homicides. And he says that there's what you're saying. He says that he is making the assumption at this point that there was some sort of blood or blood spatter found in the car. So are you basically, uh, Jennifer, saying the same thing, that there had to be something in that car that indicates foul play? Yes, because they said those words, something that indicates foul play or suspicious activity. I've read a lot about foul play out of the mouths of these investigators. And that means blood evidence. I would also expect that that car was probably really in disarray. Typically, anytime there's a struggle, you can tell because all the things are in disarray inside the car. Steve Peterson, you've been at this uh Longer than Koffendoffer. Uh, I don't want to throw you under the bus, Steve, but you're older than all of us. So uh, <laughs> that means you have that means you have wisdom, Steve Peterson. Uh, you know, to to Jennifer Koffendoffer's point, vanished is a word that TV people uh, look at this. Lindsay Shea, Shea just subbed to the cough. So please uh, follow uh, Koffendoffer, and I will pull up uh, the name one more time, which is. Break the case. Break the case with Jen Koffendoffer, FBI. Break the case with Jen Koffendoffer, FBI. I butchered it, but you know what I'm talking about. So uh, give her a follow on uh, on the YouTube. But Steve Peterson, I use the word vanish because that's a you know that's a TV word. But two women don't just vanish into the night. Um, any thoughts? Just very very broadly speaking, here, do you agree with Koffendoffer that likely they found some evidence or had to find evidence in that car? Uh, whether it be blood spatter or something of a different nature. Yeah, I do. I agree 100%. And in and, and doing some research for this case, I looked up some of the court documents that have been filed, some of the affidavits regarding the child custody dispute that occurred between the mom and the, and the father and, and so forth. And it appears that in the custody papers, it indicates that the child will exchange from one parent to the other in this location where the car was found. You know, if you read the news reports, it seems like it was just random on the side of the road. But if you read some more, if you look into it a little bit more, it says it was found in this place called the Four Corners, which is kind of like an empty lot area, still in the middle of nowhere. But that's where the judge ordered them to exchange custody, not at any one parent's residence. So it seems like the mom and the pastor's wife, Jenna, uh, Jillian Kel uh, Kelly, were parked there when they were approached and and uh, something horrific seemed to happen. So these are the women, and I have this comment up here because I want to go to cough for a reason on this question, but um, this is Jillian uh, Kelly. She is the older of the two women, 39 years old. Uh, what we know about her, a mother, the wife of a preacher, and her uh, husband, who is this preacher, just started a job at a new church. She works at a church well-known and involved in the local community. Last seen leaving with Veronica Butler to supervise Veronica's planned visitation with her two kids, who are ages eight and six. And the six-year-old was set to apparently have a birthday party. This is the younger one, Veronica Butler, of the two mothers, 27 years old, with an eight and six-year-old, trying to get custody of her children. She had been going through uh, a nasty, nasty custody uh, dispute, which we will get into. And for full transparency, we covered this last week and not a ton has changed. But um, what's interesting is always getting different perspectives. And you've got two amazing investigators here to give us their perspective uh, of what happened here. And I, I said spatter, not splatter. I I am a stickler for that. So um <laughs> I hope you're not correcting me, Chelsea Whitaker, or you're just informing us. Yes, it is spatter, not splatter, correct. Um, either which way you cut it, you don't want uh, that to uh, to be seen or to have that. Now, I had I had a uh, comment up, and Jen, the reason I brought it up, it had to do with a broken mirror on the side of the car. And what happens in these cases, um, and I'm not trying to throw that person under the bus, but uh, this is it, by the way, D love of God. Uh, allegedly, a passerby saw a broken window, unknown if the front or back window. Have you heard this? So there's always these rumors that start to circulate. I'm not saying this is inaccurate. It just hasn't been presented to us by authorities. So, Jen, when you are, I don't know, examining a case like this, um, sort of third party, if you will, the way you look at, the, at these cases now that you're retired, 
What do you do with some of this information when it is not verified by law enforcement? Well, sometimes I actually call the person. Uh, as long as it's not, I don't get into the weeds with witnesses that could be material witnesses to uh, specifics that happen. But if it's somebody on a Facebook post that's posting something as sort of a third person that heard that this happened, uh, sometimes I reach out to them, particularly on the Idaho 4 case. I felt my, I found myself having to do that because there was so much in social media. So I'm certainly not afraid to pick up the phone and give them a call and ask uh, how they knew something. I will say that a great majority of what these, what some, indiv and I'm not saying again, this one, this one could be accurate. Um, but I will say that a great majority, it's the telephone game, Right the person heard something who heard something from somebody who saw something. And that may or may not be the real detail that you see in social media. So I'm always very reluctant. I like the stuff that comes from a police scanner. Uh, I'll find myself up late into the hours of the night listening to scanners uh, because I do get actual details, like in the Cavalcante case was one and other fugitive cases. Mm -hmm. I'll listen to it. And then I know what the police are saying. But if it doesn't come from law enforcement, if it doesn't come from a court document, if it doesn't come from a, an institution or reliable source, I'm always hesitant. Uh, heed that and do with it what you will. But you're, you're hearing a, a real live former FBI, retired FBI agent telling you don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> I agree with her. Uh, with the Caval Cavalcante story, I remember uh, staying up all through the night listening to that scanner, but then you're getting police scanners or live scanners, which is, is different. But, and I'm not saying that there was not a broken window. Mm -hmm. We just don't know that to be the case for sure. Um, now rock chalk 82 was in our chat last week and, uh, he or she, uh, seems to be from this particular area. They had a lot of good information. So welcome back rock chalk. Now there is a rock chalk streaming, apparently from uh, the Oklahoma, Kansas border. Um, and that is not this rock chalk. And then someone is telling me Joel should get a hold of the channel rock chalk. So Steve Cohen, if he is listening right now, I'm sure he'll be all over it. And uh, actually tried to find them, had a little trouble finding them. So um, we will look into that Panama checking in, lest you think we are not a global show. Now, Steve Peterson, um, what, what's your take, by the way, on uncorroborated reports when cases like this happen, you get the cyber sleuths, uh, you get people who are saying things like a window is broken. We don't know for sure. Um, what do you do with that information, Steve? Do you just not pay attention to it generally? Um, well, you just you just put it in the bank, you know, and I can't say don't pay attention to it. But most of it is crap. You know, you look at the Murtaugh case and all the Reddit postings and all the Facebook postings and all the information that goes up there by all these backyard, you know, um, detectives all who know nothing about the case or nothing about the area, who know nothing. Then they all have, they all have a, a suspicion. They all have a theory. And then these, these rumors or stories, and I'm not saying they're all rumors or stories, but they kind of get spun up and they, they play, they ping pong off each other. Then you hear the same story from five, six, eight people, but it all came, it all started somewhere and it's all bull, but everybody kind of picks it up as if it's fact because somebody posted it on the web. So mm. if you can't get it from a, a reliable source, somebody in law enforcement, even I, I'll take even as a fairly reliable source, the media, if they can, if they can identify the confirmation that they got that this information is correct. You know, just a few hours ago, somebody posted on one of the, the uh, chats that I was reading that uh, they just discovered two women's bodies in the area. Stand by to see if they're identified. I can't oh. find that confirmed anywhere. Yeah, so, I'm, you know, again, it's just all this speculation, all this rumors. That there was, there was reports over the weekend that some bodies were found in a, on a Cherokee reservation. Um, and then it turned out that that reservation is about six and a half hours away. Um, and it was, they believe a, uh, a drowning victim, a young male drowning victim. So these things are going to pop up, obviously. Right. Uh, Nikki Cuds here, who was, she said she was uh, having STS withdrawal. She was on a vacation and couldn't handle it. So now that she's back from vacay, she's good to go. 
And she says, new to the case, do either of the women have a history with alcohol or mental illness? What a terrible case. Now, Veronica Butler's baby daddy, um, the father of her children, uh, just served time in jail. We'll get into this. And he is in a court-ordered rehab. Jen, what have you, have you found out anything about Veronica? I think she had some issues with uh, drug use as well. I just haven't been able to really find out uh, if there was anything very current. Have you found out anything in that regard? I agree that I think that there are some substance abuse issues in her past. We have not verified definitely what those are, but recall, you know, she was uh, associated with and had children with a uh, confirmed uh, meth user, uh, an individual associated with meth. And just from my experience, uh, when you have two individuals together in that sort of an environment, it is often the case that both individuals are partaking. I'm just saying from my experience, I'll, I'll even nudge that up to about 99% of the time uh, uh, when people are deep into addiction like meth. We're not talking about smoking marijuana. We are talking about meth. I also had to give a, a, a shout out to Rock Chalk. That is, by the way, Rock Chalk Jayhawk, go KU. She graduated, or he, in the class of 1982. I went to KU, and that's why I know that. So all the Rock Chalkers out there, all of those in that group, Rock Chalk. There you go. And uh, I'm not going to pull this up because I want to read this comment, but Amy Riley says, Kansas girl here in that area is scary. Koffendoffer is from Kansas. So um, you have something in common. Uh, Steve Peterson Far from Kansas, uh, being a, a Bostonian, but um, Annie Kay here, doesn't the location of the car near an exchange almost assure a blitz attack by the in-law family? Who else would know their travel plans? Steve Peterson, your response to this comment. Well, I think anybody involved with the families would know the travel plans. And if you saw the, the, the custody orders, you would see that the area where this vehicle was found is in the exchange area. And if you if you look more even at the custody orders, the judge assigned a certain person to sit in or supervise the exchange. If that person's not available, they listed three other people in order that would be available to supervise the exchange of the, chi the children. One of those, the last person on the list, the number three on the list, was a woman by the name of Killian. Kelly. Same first, same spelling of the name, except a K instead of J. So I wonder if that, the woman, the pastor's wife, this Jillian Kelly, I wonder if that's the woman who was ordered by the court to supervise. Perhaps that's why she was going down. I don't know. I haven't found anything that says that she was friends with yeah. Veronica. As far as, yeah. as far as we know, she was accompanying her to be um, sort of the chaperone uh, for this visitation. Coffin Doffer, is that right? I believe that to be true. Uh, they call them monitors. And I think she was overseeing the supervised visitation. Yes. Yeah, right. So she, she very well could be a completely uh, innocent standby, uh, you know, an innocent person in all of this. Um, this photo you're looking at, uh, this is the intersection where the car was abandoned uh, near Highway 95 and Road L. And uh, Jen, I don't need to tell you, um, there's not a lot out there. I joked on the show last time I wouldn't mind building a house there because I'd be left alone. Uh, but there's not there's not much to do. When you look at this photo, I didn't even notice there is a stop sign there. Um, but when you look at this photo, I mean, from an investigative standpoint, what do you see? Because you're probably not seeing it the same way that we are. Well, you've got a lot of problems here. First of all, where is the cell coverage? Is there one tower, two towers, three towers? There's not three towers. It's very difficult to pinpoint cells. Second of all, uh, I bet you anything that some cells won't even have coverage. Likely, though, these ladies had whatever it was, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, that had coverage here. But I'm worried about the cell coverage. The second thing is that leads me to another problem, and that is the geofence that could have been done right into this area. Can it be done? It, is there the proper cell tower coverage that's going to enable that process? Uh, the other problem I see is this dryness. I'm worried about tire track impressions. I'm worried about footprint impressions. Is, is that going to be a problem? 
considering you don't have moisture. Um, and then uh, the one thing I see that is a positive is, as I've always joked, and we always joke in Kansas, the state telephone pole or the state tree is a telephone pole. Mm. You know, it's so desolate there that you would think somebody could see something. I hope they're talking to truckers that drive this route. And I hope they're talking to individuals who were out on that Saturday. That's what needs to come forward to see if somebody saw something. Steve Peterson, I brought up the idea of, uh, you know, like a lone trucker uh, with Detective Phil Waters, and he seemed to think there's probably very small, very, a very small chance of that because this area is, you know, fairly remote. But this is, uh, I said this wrong last time. I don't, I'm not sure if it's an interstate, but it's a somewhat major road, the one that's running, uh, that you know, that you can't really see. Um I mean, how would you eliminate a trucker uh, from this situation? I don't know that you can. Right now, based on what we've been told, what we know officially, I don't think you can eliminate anybody. You know, the only person that you know, it, 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 and we don't even know this for certain, the only person that it looks like wasn't there was the baby daddy. Because he was re released from prison and his court orders say, you will report within 72 hours, and it appears that he has to in uh, in house rehab, and it lists where he's supposed to go. And although I can't say that it's been confirmed by law enforcement, it certainly has been confirmed by Grandma, who had custody of the kids temporarily, was supposed to be passing them off. You know, mm -hmm. so if Dad's been in re in an in house rehab program um, since the twenty second of March, and it's supposed to be, I think at least 30 to 60, maybe 90 days. I can't recall exactly what the paperwork said, but he wasn't, he wasn't there. You know what I mean? If we believe that the problem is the information we're getting is not only not confirmed, it, it's, it's sometimes contradicting each other. So it's kind of tough to speculate. Yeah. I want to introduce Dr. Michaela Sarah Mosing, who was on the show last week, and uh, she owns the largest private investigation agency in the great state of Oklahoma. Um, Ned Smith's always uh, cracking jokes, even during difficult stories, which I don't mind because that's how my mom got through the Holocaust black humor. This photo makes me thirsty. It makes me thirsty as well. Uh, <laughs> Jessica Pinkerton here says, Koffendoffer's podcast is so good. Check it out. It is Break the Case with Jen Koffendoffer, FBI. Please uh, subscribe. And uh, as Steve Cohen says, a rising tide lifts all ships. So uh, we're trying to help each other out. And uh, she's got a hell of a lot of experience. So uh, check out her podcast. But Dr. Sam Rosing, I'm going to call you, call you Dr. M from Michaela. Um, you've been there. We're now into the second week. What's running through your mind at this point? <clears throat> I have had a chance to, to uh, speak with someone um, that I've known for some years who's a very close friend of Veronica's uh, fiance and who uh, knows uh, Veronica and the family. And she she confirmed because she actually is from the same town, Ava, where, where this has happened. And the thoughts that she shared with me today was that she believes that it's from the family. She did state that uh, Wrangler, uh, the ex-spouse uh, that the baby daddy was uh, still in a rehab facility in Oklahoma City. And that's what she said. She said, I'm, I'm from the same town as they are. I know all the stories that I've heard. I've heard about the butcher and the pigs and, and all this stuff. And, uh, but she is, her, her thoughts, are that it's it's likely has something to do with the family, very possibly. She was saying uh, maybe not directly from from Wrangler, but indirectly, per, perhaps. I mean, she doesn't know that for a fact, but she was very suspicious too that here you have some somebody who is just about to lose custody of his kids, and right when that happens, a very short distance away from where they were to pick up the kids, that they go missing, magically missing, right when that's about to happen. <laughs> in a town that small, even she said, look, and I was talking to her about possibilities of human trafficking and other stuff up there. And she, I mean, I've got land, but I don't stay up there very much. But she was like, look, that place is so dead. 
like we don't really have the same type of of things that I mean that there are the drugs and the human trafficking and uh, stuff like that, but we don't really have the same uh, concerns with that necessarily. She said I would focus mostly not only but mostly on the family because there is something very amiss especially with the child custody uh situation and that's what what she believes and, and uh dr michaela you have not been officially asked to uh work on this case have you no i haven't but she is she has some 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 very big concerns about the grandma too and she said that lady is dangerous so mm. that was another i'm not saying that is a fact I'm saying right. that is an opinion of hers, but that was what she had she had expressed to me. Well, I think a lot of people are obviously looking at her very closely. Now, you mentioned Veronica Butler, the younger, the 27 year old of these two. You mentioned her fiance. Uh, so she has. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cover you up here. Um, someone's asking why we're not hearing from the family members, but um, she has a current fiance. This is not Wrangler Cole Rickman, correct? Right. That's correct. That was the ex. But she is concerned that the ex, whom she she said is in rehab somewhere in Oklahoma City, that she doesn't know where, but that she confirmed that he's in Oklahoma City at the moment in rehab, you know, likely, stress the word likely, had something to do with it indirectly, not directly because he was in rehab and he hasn't been out. He isn't in prison. He's in rehab is where he is at the moment. That's what she was conveying to me when I spoke with her earlier today about this. Yeah, interesting. And, and the reports are that uh, he was a, he is a convicted felon, and he got busted again for having a firearm, which you can't do. And he was sent to jail, and then sent to a court ordered rehab, which he entered on March twenty second. And according again, you're hearing this from Dr. Michaela and others say that it's court mandated in Oklahoma City, and that he's been there. Um, I guess Jennifer Coffendoffer, the big. I was going to ask you something totally different, but the big question is. How do we know for sure that he was there? And at this point, does the OS, they must know by now, right? The OSBI? Yes, Joe, I'm so glad you asked that question because, and, I, and I'm curious to hear uh, what my DEA brethren thinks on this. <laughs> but in, in my experience with these court ordered facilities, even though you're supposed to stay there for 30 days, he had 72 hours to report. That was issued, I believe, on the 22nd, going from memory. And so that would have made him have to go there by about the 24th. And then he was supposed to, for 30 days from whatever day he reported, not leave. And then he could leave. So, but in my experience, these rehabs, there's no guards at the door, there's no bars on the windows. It is loosey goosey people leave them all the time uh you hear about celebrities in the news but i can tell you on normal people they go in they go out they're not supposed to and remember it was ordered that he stay so he could you know if he didn't stay uh be in trouble but it was only four and a half hours i i can't tell you how many cases where people commit crimes like this where they're supposed to be someplace and they skedaddle out, they leave their cell phone, so on and so forth. And then all the cases too, where they hire people. I mean, look at, or, or otherwise ask, the Tylee Riley, uh, Riley, you know, that whole case is in court right now. JJ Vallow, uh, Bradigan, right? Another custody situation, Cassie Carley. There are so many situations where people are supposed to be in one place, but they're at another. OSBI knows though. Yeah, for sure. Steve Peterson, um, you're the drug expert here, not because of usage, because you got it off the street. So um, I apologize. I'm coming to you from uh, Studio 1K in the Waldman residence, and uh, there's chaos breaking out uh, all around me. So, But Steve, to you, um, what about this drug-ordered rehab? You know, he allegedly has been in there, forced to be in there, is there a chance that he wasn't there uh, the evening of these uh, disappearances? Well, I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that Jen thinks that I should know about rehab. <laughs> <laughs> I've never actually been in one, so I don't really know no. all the specifics of it. But is it possible to go in and, and on the books be there, but in reality not? 
Sure. All depends on the facility. All depends on who runs it. All depends on the policy. You know, in theory, there are checks and balances in the system to make sure. But if it's four hours away, you figure that's eight hours round trip. You got to plan this pretty well to be at the right place at the right time if you're the guy doing it. Can you consider hiring or somebody else to do it for you while you're out? Hell, he wouldn't have to be in rehab. He could have done that from jail. You know what I mean? You can get people to do your 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 nasty deeds for you while you're incarcerated. So it doesn't matter whether you're in rehab or you're or you're in jail. You don't physically have to be there. One yeah. of the one of the listeners brought up a very good point, and they had uh, typed in the chat. I'm curious who found the car, because if this was an exchange time, in theory, would you not think that grandma and the kids would have been there at any minute to exchange the children? And they would have been the one to find the car there with, with the missing people? Why didn't they find it? Why didn't they report it? Or did they know something happened, therefore they just didn't show? You know, that's a great point. That's a very, a very interesting point. That's uh, so, these, these, these points that you make, they're always so subtle. I didn't think of it that way, but that makes uh, amazingly good sense, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... Dr. Michaela, back to you. You mentioned that this uh, source that you were talking to, this person who knows the family, uh, that this person said to you that the grandmother is a dangerous person. I'm curious if you ask for any uh, follow up on that and what what they meant by that. No, I didn't have very much time with this individual, but she 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 had just made it clear that that the grandma was was very very dangerous and bad and was to be avoided and you know just trouble and bad bad news and uh, i didn't i didn't get the opportunity to ask why because i didn't have a long enough time to talk with her more to find out but i wish that i, mean, I wish that i had been that uh, fortunate but i but i just wasn't with time hmm. um the pss the philadelphia shoulder surgeon is there any, any info on grandma what well, you're hearing right now that she's allegedly dangerous uh, but we don't really have much info we do know from court records uh that she had uh you know petitioned on behalf of the court basically to get uh custody of these kids saying that the son wasn't willing or able to take care of the kids that he had a drug problem and that the uh and we'll get into this in a little bit in more um depth but that the veronica butler's family was sexually abusing uh the children as as far as we know these children are in the care of Tiffany Adams, who is the grandmother. Um, but Jen, back to what Steve was just saying. I mean, such an kind of obvious point, but uh, eloquently stated by him and something that I wouldn't necessarily think of because I didn't do what you guys did for a living. But um, if they were the ones to meet uh, for the pickup, why wouldn't they be the ones reporting, hey, we don't see this car or, hey, we saw the car and it was abandoned. It was, th it was three miles away, but isn't it curious? Uh, right now, we don't know, but as far as we know, they're not the ones who reported this. Uh, it's curious at best. <laughs> Let me put it that way, in my opinion. And then also, uh, my understanding, so the New York Post originally said that uh, the ex, you know, the baby's daddy found them. I think that was inaccurate. I think it was the fiance is who they meant that found them. So that made sense because look, you saw it's nowhere land. It's obvious that to get from point A to point B, if someone doesn't show up and, and you can't get them on the phone, you're going to follow that path. And plus he probably knew the drop off site. So it made sense that he would have found the vehicle. What doesn't make an iota of sense is that the people that were supposed to meet didn't find the vehicle. So it's incongruent. And that usually means uh, a significant clue. Yeah. Uh, Laurel Backer, Chad, I missed the name of Koffendoffer's podcast. It is Break the Case with Jennifer Koffendoffer, FBI. Check it out. Um, Dr. Michaela, to you, um, we're getting uh, not just reports, but I'm getting photos sent to me of people on horseback kind of searching on their own. Uh, this is the kind of land where you can take a horse out there. But um, again, this is just massive sort of nowhere land, right? I mean, 
Where would you even begin? What are you looking for, do you think, if you're on horseback here? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, things that you would want to investigate. I mean, apart from the car, the DNA, any forensics. I mean, if you're on your horse, I mean, you would want to, I mean, look at the land, uh, see if there's any other clues, talk talk to people. I mean, yeah, it is like a big, open, wide desert. It makes you thirsty, like you said, just 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 having to look at it but through but in a town that small people know stuff and they know things that they don't always disclose and i think looking for like any kinds of a a, a, a camera any type of a video camera on uh uh at any of the stores or any of the homes i mean some somebody will have seen something because i live in a very remote area with my family and we know every car that goes past. I mean, we know all of our neighbors. I mean, we know everything that happens in the town. If something big happens, I mean, we've heard about it before the person ever uh, tells us. So, I mean, that's something that you definitely have to look at. And you need to look at the phones, at the uh, text message, the so- social media, <clears throat> the cell-, cell towers. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can check out to be able to do. Now, one thing that I would like to bring up is that this Tiffany Adams has an extensive criminal record. <laughs> She has so many different charges on her. Uh, on do you, do you know what they are? Do you know what some of them are? Oh, I know what they all are. Yeah, yeah, I can see them all here. I mean, failing to protect kids, a lot of speeding, driving without license. Um, I mean, I'm looking at them. I can send them to uh, uh, to you, but I'm pulling up. I mean, I can see everything. I can see her social security number, everything, and it's it's pretty extensive. Um, so there's quite quite a bit on here that that she obviously has a disregard for the law. <laughs> so. uh, Jen, Jen Coppendop, I know you have to jump in a minute or two, but um, what what do you make of that? I mean, of someone who has a long criminal record, as Dr. McHale is literally pulling up, um, you know, a background check on her right now. She's got a rap sheet uh, that doesn't help the cause in terms of saying, well, she probably had nothing to do with it. It does the exact opposite, right? That maybe there's something here. Yeah, but I will tell you that, and I looked at that briefly before coming on, uh, and I do recall it being a lot of traffic violations. Yeah, there were that too. Uh, Do you recall, I don't recall seeing anything of a violent nature. Please correct me if I'm wrong, though. Uh, Looks like there's a a failure to protect children, Uh, a lot of traffic stuff. Very good. Failure to to, uh, carry insurance. Uh, Yeah, there's a lot of, I think, driving without a uh, driver's license. Yeah, there's a lot of traffic stuff on here, too. I would be interested if I pulled up a a social media scan uh, to see what that pulls on her, too. I could do that as well and see what it pulls up on her. Um, But, but yeah, but, uh, yeah, there's quite a bit over the years. I mean, feel feel free to do that uh, while we're while we're talking. If you want, then just let us know. Uh, Jen, you let you tell me. I don't know. Do you have to bounce? No, no, I'm good. I was going to say there's a lot of people in this part of the country mm-hmm. that have sort of a sovereign citizen, a little bit mentality. There's a yeah. lot of people out there like that. In other words, they don't like to have licenses. They don't want people telling them to wear a seatbelt, and and they hate to pay taxes. Man, mm-hmm. that might be all of us. Yeah, look, this is, this is right, right, Jen, right on cue here. I got to know for two dollars. Says Granny's boyfriend is a sovereign citizen. Just explain that See, what that means to those who do not know. It, we in the bureau we have cases like this all the time in this part of the country, and then as we go further west and northwest, and basically they're people that don't want to recognize government. They feel like they ha- are sovereign. In other words, they should govern themselves and laws and rules, and so they very much disregard rules like having a driver's license like following the speed limit so when i saw that list i immediately thought this seems more like a sovereign citizen but i will say that when you disregard those laws you also likely disregard more important laws Mm -hmm. uh by the way i think i'm a sovereign citizen because i do not want to pay my taxes and i don't even want to do my taxes let alone pay my taxes (laughs) and i was complaining about it so much last week now I'm waiting for the account to get back to me. Um, Lisa Wilson or Lisa, I'm not sure which, the car was not found at the pickup place. 
Um, it wasn't where they were supposed to have this drop off. Steve Peterson, um, you know, they always tell me who knows nothing about nothing that that uh, family court is way more dangerous than criminal court. Uh, should there have been a safer, more secure place where they were set to meet for this visitation? Or is it easier said in, in hindsight than in reality? Well, hindsight is always twenty twenty. You know, if you look at, historically speaking, if you look at the documents, it shows that um, that both uh, Veronica and her and the baby daddy lived together at grandma's house for a while. And then the baby daddy left. Grandma kicked her out. His own mother kicked him out before he went to jail. And then uh, Veronica lived with the children there at the place. I, I don't know if there's a separate living. I don't know what the, the living situation was. But at some point, but she stayed there for a while. And then at some point in time, mom said, okay, you got to go. And that caused the break. And, of course, the baby daddy was never able to care for the kids, ever. Didn't want the kids. So when they had the established visitation rights between mom and, and dad, Grandma stepped in and, and took up for the dad. Whenever the dad was supposed to have the kids, grandma took the kids. And then it became it, it got to some point that grandma had the kids, and now mom has visitation. So I couldn't find all the records in the time I had to research this. I couldn't find all of them to do a timeline mm. on who got who, when, and when it changed. But it did change. And then so the court set up this exchange place. So it didn't seem like there was a tremendous amount of animosity between grandma and the baby, the baby mama. Didn't seem like there was. Certainly there could have been. That's why I'm assuming they set it up at this remote location only because, again, I'm assuming even though we're to talking about Oklahoma and mom lived in Kansas in a different state, it wasn't that far away. You know, maybe a 35 minute drive, maybe 45 minute drive from mom's place the grandma's place so they try to pick a place somewhere in the middle somewhere that's convenient to maybe to go to the sheriff's office or the police department hell that could have been another 45 minutes in another direction you know when i did a map quest search of the location and look i mean there's nothing there nothing so to see you could see find a circle k or a whatever they have out there in oklahoma or the equivalent of you know, to find some place to have a drop off, to have a meet, it didn't seem like there was many choices. So, you know, I have to take it upon the court for making a decision that they felt was safe. I don't think the court would intentionally set up something that was unsafe if there was concerns about that. Yeah. Um, latest uh, from the COE here, the OSB. I uh, says foul play suspected due to evidence found in and around the abandoned car. We do not know the whereabouts of the mom's family was asked to not speak to media and the public. We can ask uh, Jen about that in a moment. But Dr. Michaela, this is a great point from uh, the surgeon in Philly. How does someone and this is uh, Tiffany Adams, the grandmother who has, quote unquote, failure to protect children. How is she in custody of these kids through the courts? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that that slip through the cracks all the time. I mean, I, I've seen people, for example, like a long time ago, I used to teach a school too. You know, I was a superintendent, intern, and, and all that stuff. And we had a case where one of our students, the half brother, the dad, I mean, people were just abusing physically and, and sexually of like, like one of my elementary school students. And they initially pulled him out and then they uh, they actually gave him to the custody of the grandparents who then in turn brought him right back over to the parents. <laughs> so, I mean, stuff like that happens all the time. There's there's a lot fewer teeth and, and enforcement than we think there is, especially out in a place like that. Um, they, they both, I mean, she and her son, her son has... Uh, like the possession of the firearm after a felony offense, but he also has drugs and a lot of uh, traffic violations too. You know, I mean, uh, speeding and and not wearing the seatbelt and a whole bunch of other stuff, just like his mother. So that's probably where he where he gets a lot of it from. 
you know, is that kind of like, like, don't, don't tell me what to do kind of an attitude, you know, like, like as Gotham was saying, you know, kind of the sovereign citizen type attitude, even if you're not formally identifying as a sovereign citizen, but. Hmm. Um, I am not t paying with a question. I don't think this is very likely at all, but Jennifer Koffendoffer, you're the expert. Uh, I'm not t paying one of our great mods. Is there a possibility that this could be a planned disappearance? How common is it for people to plan their own disappearances together? I think it's probably pretty rare, isn't it, Jen? Well, these ladies are not Thelma and Louise types. Um, you know, they're not in the same age range. It, she was specifically, I believe, the monitor. Uh, in this case, I would say that is not the situation at all. And recall, law enforcement has found evidence of foul play in that car. So I think that eliminates any idea of a Thelma Louise, hey, let's abandon the car and take off to Vegas. Hmm. Uh, this is uh, Hugaton. Hugaton is where the uh, the women are from. Population, just to show you how remote it is there. Man, living in Miami, that house right there looks kind of appealing. Imagine that. Uh, <laughs> no one would be bothering me, no traffic. Yeah. Uh, I probably have a beautiful view of the uh, eclipse, which I didn't see at all. It looked like a normal day here in Miami. Um, the 2020 census for Hugaton, population 3,747. That's 976 families, but 20, more than a quarter of that 3,700 is uh, kids under the age of 18. So uh, you're talking like two grand and change of people. So it's a small place. Steve Peterson, where could someone, uh, let's just think worst case scenario, but I mean, assuming they're no longer with us, where could someone take and put a body here? I guess the answer is just about anywhere, right? It depends how much time you have, you know, and it depends on what you hear, what rumors you believe, because right now it's all rumors, right? So if you look around what's there and, and you, and you accept as fact, what some of the bloggers are putting out there. And I, and I don't doubt that they're putting out correct information. It, it just may not have any bearing on this, but there's a lot of pig farms, right? There's a lot of slaughterhouses. It's a lot of, you know, when you do that kind of work, you have ways of disposing of, of large animal carcasses. So if you wanted to get rid of a human being's body, what better place to bring it where they might incinerate a hog or, or cattle? you know, or even a horse. So it, it appears that grandma's husband or ex-husband runs a slaughterhouse and for pigs. He's got a big pig farm. With a slaughter. I have no idea if that is in fact true, but I'm just thinking if you want to want to think worst case scenario, worst ca to me, worst case scenario is grandma set it up, had no intention of sharing the kids. You know, that poor uh, Jillian is just the wrong place at the wrong time. She's She's just a victim of circumstance. They're, the goal is to take out mom, and whoever's with her is with her. They take out both women. They bring the bodies over. They they dispose of them at the slaughterhouse, maybe, you know, um, and and you, you'd never know, depending on how many slaughterhouses there are and who you're going to search. And But I have to assume if, if these are true, if these facts are in, case, uh, are in fact true, that, that Oklahoma, the SBI in Oklahoma is already looking at all of this. I can't think that we're sitting here in a podcast coming up with investigative ideas that those guys haven't already thought of. Yeah. You know? Well, here, here's like the very dark, macabre um, <laughs> part of this, uh, Jen Koffendoffer, is that we talked about this on the last show. Hogs apparently will eat anything, including bone. I mean, is there a possibility, Jen Koffendoffer, that these women were literally fed to these animals and they are just gone. Well, macabre, you, you stated that right. Look, I grew up on a farm and we raised hogs and cattle and sheep and chicken and rabbits and horses and everything else. And hogs will eat anything and everything. And, uh, I, I can, I'll leave it at that. But can they, can they eat, I mean, again, this is horrible to even ask, but can they eat bone? People are saying that they can't eat large bone, but can they? Can they eat large bones? 
yes, I don't know if to the point of disintegration or anything, mm. but absolutely to get that marrow inside, that's the best part. Oh, man. Um, Dr. Michaela, you know, you're, you're a private investigator, but if you're with the OSBI, I mean, what are you doing right now? What can you do right now? This is into the second week. I mean, where are you, where are you even looking at this point? Well, if I were with the OSBI, I would be following every single single lead. Of course, I mean, starting with the vehicle, I mean, starting with the crime scene, the alleged crime crime scene, because it looks like there's most likely a crime here. So, I mean, uh, uh, starting with that, um, extending to, I mean, there's not that many families out there. You could probably talk to the whole town, you know, within a, a relatively short period of time. It would take a little while, but but it's not like it's a big major metropolitan. Uh, a city and even if you do i mean you talk with one person you're basically talking with the whole town because everybody's going to know about it to some uh degree um i would be checking the cell the uh, uh, uh cell towers finding out the path that they took anybody that they talk to uh, uh text messages i would be getting uh su subpoenas to the uh, uh, cell phone companies uh google subpoenas facebook subpoenas TikTok subpoenas, anything like that. I would be talking to family, to friends, to the neighbors. Um, I would be definitely investigating the family and the associates of the grandmother and of a, a Wrangler and people who were close and who had motive, something to lose. Because, I mean, like Jennifer was saying, I mean, if, for example, like you have this grandmother who is sup supposedly, allegedly, very violent or mean or bad or whatever. And I haven't met her in person. So I'm not saying this as a factual thing, but if she is that bad and she didn't want to share custody with the kids, I mean, some of the people in small towns don't always play by the rules. And I know, cause I live in a town that's like the population of about a hundred people. And we actually live outside of the town. So we don't even have that, I mean, you know, so yeah. Wow. Dr. Ram, where, where do you go to get a, a, a carton of milk when you need milk? There's a little store in town or what? We have to go to the next town over because our town doesn't even have a grocery store. Well, it's got a co-op. I take that back, but that's not like anywhere close. It's like a miniature gas station, sort of, that's not always open. But we have to go into the next town to be able to go um, buy anything. I mean, and even then the store isn't that big. Like, you know, I mean, it's not that huge. So, or we can make our own, you know, with cows or whatever, but goats. Dr. Michaela, I know this is only show number two for us, but I might have to invite myself and my three kids out there, show them a different, uh, a different way of life. Yeah. It's like when, uh, like Paris Hilton, what was the show Paris Hilton was in her and, uh, Nicole Richie. They, uh, they, the they, they had, yeah, that, that one, the simple life. That that's what I need A simple life. That's a good title. That's what um, we moved out there. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Uh, look at this. Uh, this question. I don't know if it's Leah, Leah, Lee, Anna Davis. Uh, to Jennifer Koppendoffer, given it appears that two women were attacked, do the experts think that there are multiple assailants? What do you think, Jen? I think that either scenario is possible. And, and this is why it's too hard to narrow down at this point. First of all, a gun can have control a lot of people. Uh, typically, people cower down to other people with guns. They don't run. They just do what they're told to do because they don't want to be shot. So we don't know if somebody could have been controlling by a gun. As I said, there's rumors about weaponry. Again, those are rumors. They're uncorroborated right now. Uh, but one person could handle this crime. Uh, but I would think if it is something more elaborate, that this would have been a conspiracy. In other words, if they were taken from that location because they've searched in, all in around that location, so we know they're not in and around there. So if they were taken to another location, there could likely be co-conspirators. Uh, this is a great quote, if it's true, from The Simple Life. Does Walmart sell walls from Paris Hilton? Um, I love that. If I was... Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell my son to use that as his high school yearbook quote uh, when that day comes. <laughs> um, I like it so much. Uh, St Steve Peterson, you know, law enforcement investigators like you, you're always talking. Um, by the way, people think it's hilarious that you knew it was a simple life, Steve. You must be a reality show junkie. That you're the one. You're the one on this panel that knew. Um, 
But, but Steve, Even what about... I just watched a documentary on Paris Hilton a few weeks ago. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fortuitous. Yeah. Steve, what about, um, I mean, does law enforcement need to go back and, and re-examine their timeline? How important is a timeline in this case? Do they need to go back and see what was happening? I always hear you have to have a timeline that extends a week before uh, whatever the crime that you believe occurred uh, from whenever that point is, you have to go back a week. Is there anything that needs to be done in regards to a timeline right now? Well, I think timelines are incredibly important, incredibly important, especially if you're talking a, about a, an event or a crime that involves more than one person, right? If you have multiple participants in a crime, you create a timeline to show and you go back as far as you, as far as you want to go back to show the actions of some people, the intents of some people, the, the commonalities, perhaps the methods of communication. You go back and you look at all these things over time. And then one of the, one of the listeners put into the, uh, into the chat that the cell phones were found in the car. Well, if you find a cell phone there and you're able, if they don't have a code on it, if you're able to break the code, you should be able to look, look up the text messaging. There would be messaging going back and forth leading up to the exchange. You know, this is 2024. Nobody calls anybody anymore. We just text everybody. We communicate like this. We don't use our mouths. We use our thumbs and we text everything. So you'd be communicating, all right, I'll be at this place. At this time, I'll be there. You, you look at all of those things. And maybe if you don't have the phones, go back to the phone company and you can subpoena and get court records, subpoena or court documents. And court orders requiring them to turn over the information. It takes a little bit longer, of course, that way if you don't have the actual devices. But these are the things that Jennifer even mentioned. You know, you look at the cell towers and you try to figure out triangulation. And, and the, you know, that sets it. And then you go forward from the time of the event, continue on to where we are, I wouldn't say today, but you look a couple of days after the event. Where were people there? Who reacted? How did they react? Maybe, maybe the FBI in Oklahoma is telling the families, don't put anything out there. Don't get on the media. Don't. Hey, if, if, if a family member disappeared, I may not be happy with the family member, but this woman is still the mother of your grandchildren. And if the mother of your grandchildren disappears, wouldn't you, as just a decent human being, want to help the kids find their mom? You'd want to be on the media. You'd want to be making statements. You'd want to make it at least appear that you were very concerned and you were trying to help. The fact that you go into this, this recluse atmosphere you know, and, and you don't speak to anybody, that only, in the court of public opinion, that only makes you look worse. Makes you look worse. Do so, Dr. Mc yeah, I'm sorry, Steve. I didn't mean to cut you out there. But Dr. Michaela, no. did, when you spoke to this person, did they, t from what we're being told, just to Steve's point, uh, the family and friends are being told not to speak to the media, which Phil Waters, our detective, loved that because he doesn't think the public needs to know everything. Uh, did, sh did that person give you any indication that they're not supposed to be talking to the media? Well, she, she herself, and I'm not going to divulge her name or anything, but didn't want to speak with anybody either. I mean, she was just like, I mean, not, not wanting to speak, but, uh, but I think that when I, 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 you were saying over there, Doc, about the, um, about like the grandma, for example, you know, wanting to, uh, to be like a decent human being and like caring about the mother of her grand grandkids, <laughs> maybe you have more faith in humanity than, than I do. And I wish that I did, but there's a lot of people out there who are not good people and they're not. And I've seen them and I've worked with some, and I'm sure that I have no doubt that both of you'll have two, you know, because some of you guys have been in this field for years as well. And I just, but I don't always believe in the greatness of humanity. And I would hope, like you said, that they would care, but I don't always see that in humans on a lot of days in the type of work that we do. Also, I think that, one of the big things is that we need to be looking for the motive. Who has motive to kill these two individuals? In a town that small, who has the most motive to want to do something and why? And to me, to me, just going upon that alone tends to really point toward the family. I don't know that for a fact, but it tends to point toward the family. And 
I can see why they're saying, you know, don't, don't speak, don't, don't go out to the media. I mean, the same with the gag order in the uh, uh, Brian Kuberger case, you know, where they're trying to, to prevent everybody from uh, uh, talking and spreading information and this stuff. But I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I think well, we're going to find some interesting stuff soon. Yeah, Dr. Michaela, I mean, just to that point, uh, Crystal here is saying that people are scared to speak out. Have you found it uh, to be true that in this type of small town that people generally don't want to speak for fear that, you know, their neighbor is going to think that they're either ratting or that they're, you know, violating some kind of private trust? Yes. And the, the person that I know who told me what they knew today seem to have that that same kind of fear because they were also from the same small town where Veronica was from. And she was adamant that, that she didn't want anybody to know who she was, what her name was. She didn't want to talk with anybody. And that is, I mean, in a town that small, I mean, everybody knows you. And if you make friends or you make enemies with the wrong per- person, it's going to hurt. And they can do some real damage to you. I've seen that happen in our town. And there's been things on the news media about people doing crazy things. Yeah. By the way, Laura Engel was supposed to join us. I, I knew this was going to happen. She's actually out in that area right now. So I hope she's staying safe. She actually sent me an email that was sent to News Nation just to let them know her license plate number because she's in a rental car. Her photographer is in a separate car with their license plate. So they're taking precautions, um, obviously, to stay safe in such remote areas. Um, but, you know, coming from Miami or coming from Boston, where Steve is originally, um, you know, this is a different beast um, in a very rural, very rural section of Oklahoma. Um, Jen, have you given thought? I, I know you have, but um, just the possible motives here. Bundy Data says it's tax time. So who claimed the kids? Was there anger about that? Claiming the kids at a certain income level can mean several thousand dollars. Who gets to claim these kids? I mean, that's one thing. The other thing, obviously is custody um but what about motive um in in you know in the time that you've been able to think about this uh do you tend to think it is related to this custody issue i would my needle would be pointing in that way in other words that would be one of the first uh items i would look at so when we investigate it's really kind of a process of elimination you take the most obvious inner circle person with a motive, and you either look to show that that person, there is no way that person was involved or your facts start pointing toward that person. So as you're collecting information, your needle starts moving in one direction of or another. But the first place you're going to look is the inner circle with somebody who had motive. And that certainly is anyone who wanted to have custody of those kids. But I wanted to touch on a couple points. One, You'll recall that they locked down the school where those kids were the day uh, after, you know, on Monday. Yep. And then they locked down, I think, on Tuesday. And I think what the OSBI commander said uh, was, I guess, they're still keeping some sort of eye on the children. I don't know exactly what that means, but I thought that was all very interesting. So now you're looking at, who does law enforcement think would want to kill the mom and who would want to kill the kids? And I will say, you know, some people believe that if you can't get custody of them or for other reasons, I mean, have they looked into life insurance issues? I don't, I don't know, but money always can be a key component. Do I think the kids are in danger necessarily? I don't know, but I don't know why law enforcement would lock down a school uh, if they didn't believe they could be. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was about the closed lip of everybody. First of all, and I, Steve, I don't know if you did this. I did this. I'm just going to admit it. When I interviewed somebody that was a critical witness, the last words out of my mouth were, I am asking you, please do not discuss our conversation. Don't talk about it with anyone. This is between us. This is an ongoing investigation, and you could literally ruin the chance of justice for the individual uh, that was either killed or or involved in something. And and I would leave them with that. And I don't I don't know of anyone that ever talked. They probably did, 
but it never hurt the investigation. And, and, and then finally, when my background was being done, when I was first getting in the bureau, I was 24 years old. Uh, they went to a neighbor, knocked on the door, FBI, and we want to ask some questions about Jennifer, you know, my maiden name. And the people said, sorry, we don't know her. Shut the door. The next call was to me, Jennifer, oh my God, the FBI is looking at you. I just want you to know. That is the mentality you are dealing with here. Of course, I said, hey, listen, they're doing my background. Call them back. But my point is, is that a lot of people in these small towns, just like the good doctor was saying, they don't want to talk. They don't want to be snitches. They don't want to get involved. So I'm not surprised at all. Uh, Jen, someone asked if you can search the home of a sovereign citizen, if you're the FBI or the OSBI. Heck yeah. <laughs> they need is a warrant. Yeah, that's what, that's what I figured. Awesome. By the way, uh, for those tuning in, tomorrow morning, uh, the Crumbleys, James and Jennifer, are being sentenced. They're the parents of school shooter Ethan Crumbly. We're going to have that live tomorrow morning. And uh, Brother Council will be here uh, to give us analysis as that goes on live tomorrow morning uh, outside of Detroit, Michigan. And then tomorrow night, we are following up on the Sebastian Rogers case. And I think we're going to stay on this case as well, because uh, this right now is a wild mystery. Uh, Steve Peterson, according to Cindy, there was a custody hearing coming up April 19th. Grandma was probably going to lose custody to mom. That sounds like a very big uh, motive to me, potentially. Uh, what do you do about that if, in fact, this is all true, uh, if you're an investigator? <laughs> well, it just gets you looking at grandma a little bit more. Uh, more focused because there are reasons. You know, one thing I haven't, we haven't discussed. And one thing that I'm, I'm somewhat confused about is the um, Jillian Kelly, right? The court ordered monitor of this, of this exchange. Her husband's a pastor. They live in Kansas. He's just been transferred to Nebraska. Uh, you know, why is it, why are we not hearing more from him looking for his wife? You know, this is just, it seems to be, to me, an innocent person stuck between, you know, the Sopranos of Oklahoma, and they're getting into this big fight over the child, over the children. But this poor woman's in the middle, and she ends up being an innocent person who disappears just because she was the last name on the list to go go for the ride. If I were her husband, I would be, I don't care what Oklahoma SBI would say. If they told me to just don't say anything. You would have to present me with some overwhelming evidence why I would not be on TV and screaming at the top of my lungs looking for my wife, because yeah. I would be, and I would bring I would bring the entire congregation to camp from Kansas down to Oklahoma <laughs> to help me find my wife. Good for and, you. So I think it's kind of strange that nothing's happened from there. That just strikes me as strange. Yeah, Dr. Michaela, what do you make of that? Uh, again, Jillian Kelly's father, a prominent, you know, pastor in that small town. Uh, he's a pastor at a new church now, and we haven't heard a thing as far as I know. Um, do you agree with Steve? I do. I would be doing the same thing if if it were my wife that had gone missing. I'd be out beating the streets. I don't care who who told me not 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 to. And I applaud you for for that line of thinking, uh, uh, Doc. I appreciate that a lot because that's good. Um, but it, it's possible maybe he's just insecure and likes to follow authority figures and does exactly what they say. I don't know. One thing that I did want to mention is I uh, was texting with Laura Ingram, and she says that uh, she is fine. She's not quite on the scene yet, and she has just been stopping every hour to do a newscast for a News Nation just to let y'all know. So she's okay as, as of the moment. So Thank you, and I, I will uh, I will check in with her as, as well. So um, but that's that's always good to know. There you go. I love it. Uh, good, good to know. Um, Jennifer Koffendoffer, we're in the second week now. Um, what do investigators do, say, think when all this time begins to pass and there's literally no sight of these women? Obviously, it's not a good sign uh, that time has passed. Do you have hope that there's a possibility we find them alive? Or do you think that's less and less likely? I always have hope, but uh, the brain side of me in this case doesn't have much hope. 
uh, the heart has a lot of hope, but I mean, you no, know, based on my experience, I, I think that probably something very bad happened to them and I would be surprised if they're with us. I'm sorry to say yeah. that. Um, I think that's, uh, a, uh, a sad reality, an awful truth in this case. Um, and we're going to find out, I think hopefully one way or the other, Steve, I keep going back to this. I mean, this is a relatively, I mean, it's a very large area of land, but it is a small place with a community where everyone knows everybody, you know, hypothetically speaking, if the grandmother did have something to do with this, wouldn't someone say something to somebody? I mean, if you're an investigator, how many times can you go back to this grandmother and grill her and try to get some answers? Well, you know, fear is is quite a dominating uh, emotion. And I think if they really think, if the neighbors, if the local people think grandma is involved with the death of these two women over the grandchildren, then them speaking out is just going to bring the wrath of Khan onto them. I don't want that to happen. Now, if SBI swoops in and picks up Granny and they press charges against her, I think you would then find all these people coming out of the woodwork but suddenly with information because now they feel safe. Grandma's behind bars. She's not going to be dangerous. She's not going to hurt us. There might be more chance of people cooperating then than now because now she's out. And, that, you know, they don't want to be pig food themselves too soon. Oh, hmm. uh, we talked – we toss this question to Jennifer and Steve. So how about Michaela this time around from Michelle Spore? Couldn't it just be random? Someone mentioned earlier in the chat, and someone did say this, that there are 18 unsolved homicides in this area and two people missing. If this is true, isn't that a high number for such a small community? Um, what do you think of this, Michaela? Well, it is a high number. I've seen very high, high numbers. I used to live in the bush of Alaska. And we saw pretty high high numbers of missing Native American girls there too. I mean, kidnappings, rapes, and murders and stuff. I mean, that were just that would go uninvestigated, unsolved. I mean, the same thing with that. I think it is right that that they're not likely to want to talk. I agree with you whole, wholeheartedly. Um, or they may be fr friends with them. I mean, we had a case in a town not far away from where I live where they burned down the house while they were in it of a gay couple. Uh, two, two, two guys because they had a black son and they were gay. So they burned down their house and they sat on the, the front porch and they watched it burn. Uh, and the fire department didn't even come out. So, I mean, you can also have that tribal mentality where they're all friends or, or they're too afraid to talk or it's a mixture of that. But I think that 18 in a town that small was an incredibly high, high number. Yes. Is it uncommon? Not necessarily. Hmm. And Michaela, you know, you're very open about um, being a gay woman and you have a partner. Have, have you experienced uh, hate and racism in Oklahoma and where, where you live? I mean, how tough has it been there? It's been pretty hard because I'm also transgender, too. So that's even even harder. And I mean, living with my wife. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we thought like when we moved out to the countryside, it was going to be really, really bad. It has been bad racially. They, uh, uh, I pulled over my, uh, my Uber driver last December 31st for being non-white. And I mean, I'm as white as they come and I can spot that, that uh, racism against like a non-white per person. It was pretty, pretty terrible out right close to where we live in the town, kind of where we live. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, Oklahoma, the South as a whole has a ton of anti-LGBT bills, anti-transgender bills that are horrible and deplorable, absolutely atrocious, um, that are out right, right now all throughout the nation. I mean, Donald Trump and I mean, some of the presidents and things, the, that the governor is terrible. Ryan uh, uh, Walters is terrible. The uh, a, a superintendent of, of education, I, yeah, it's, it's bad. It's, wow. it's, it's really bad. And I can't tell you how many instances I have come into. Uh, I mean, that's why we have guns and several of them at our, our location where we live. And we're not afraid to use them. Wow. So, um, sorry to hear that. And I hope things improve. Um, so Alyssa, yeah. Alyssa M. here. 
uh, to Koffendoffer, if they wanted to harm uh, them, why take them to another location? It was isolated enough to not be seen. Interesting point, Jennifer. Well, well, I think they would take them to another location because um, it doesn't make sense to have this horrific t uh, scene there where you do have passerbys You're right by a highway. Um, so you might be able to get them under control and get them in a car, but certainly uh, that wouldn't be a place to, you know, dig a grave, hide a body, be out there for an extended period of time. I think uh, the goal uh, would be to get control of the individuals, get them in a vehicle and leave. And Jen, you, you tell people watching your uh, career from Renee Voice brand, could the grandmother abscond uh, this Tiffany Adams with the children? Right now, I assume the OSBI has got to have eyes on her, um, which, I mean, do they, do you think, before we go any further? Oh, it, likely, it, maybe, loosely. You know, it really just comes down to manpower, resources. Whenever you get a big case like this, you still have all your other cases going on, all sorts of other crimes. It's It's resource intensive, and now you need to put – they said their number one priority on this case. So you're pulling detectives and officers off of their normal duties. And, and I think they're spread too thin probably to keep a 24 seven eye, but honestly, why would they leave now? I think they'll ride this out a little while. I don't think they're going to go on uh, OJ Simpson, you know, Bronco getaway. I think she'll sit tight. And if she's even involved, we don't even know. We're just, you know, talking about this possible hypothesis. I don't think she's going to go anywhere. Uh, a few more minutes and then we will start to wrap. I've got to let uh, these fine guests roll out. And a few. Uh, Hunter McKee, who's the spokesperson for the OSBI, said, uh, Steve Peterson, this one's for, me, for you. Right now, our aid, this was uh, late last week. Right now, our agents are still investigating where their final destination was and where these women were traveling to. We know they were traveling from Kansas. We know they were driving through Oklahoma and their abandoned vehicle was found in Oklahoma. But uh, Laura Engel, I mean, she told me today, she went to the OSBI. They're not talking either. Uh, so it's not just the family and friends. Um, and then you've got this question coupled with it. Uh, this is Pam, who's got family in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, could the gag order be in place because law enforcement and it's not a true gag order, but they're asking people not to talk because law enforcement already knows what happened. Family knows, but they're just working through the facts, making sure they have it all figured out until an arrest is made. What do you think of this, Steve? Well, that's a possibility. I mean, if I were the pastors, or if I was, was Jillian Kelly's husband and I had the SBI telling me, hey, I understand you how you feel. Please don't come down here raising cane with all your parishioners. And I, I'm, we are we are this close to making an arrest. We know who did. If somebody sat down and explained that to me, I would be like, okay, I, I will give you some time. But I mean, my wife's missing, so I'm not going to be that patient. But I, I will give you some time to go ahead and dot the I's and cross the T's and make sure that everything's right. And I'll keep quiet for a while, but there will come a time when I'm not going to be quiet anymore. And when I do spill out, I'm going to make it quite well known that the reason I haven't come forward earlier is because you told me to not, not to, because you were this close to making arrest and identifying, you know, the, the, the suspects, the criminals. So yeah, that's a possibility. They very well may already know. They may have the answers of all the questions we've been asked and they're just trying to make sure they get their ducks in a row. So when they go and arrest grandma, they can not only take the kids away from grandma, put her in jail. They can identify perhaps who else was involved, who removed the bodies, where, where assuming they're, they're deceased, where we might find any remains of anybody. I mean, this might all, all be planned out or, or in the process of, of being uh, uh, released soon once all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. All the worst thing in the world you want to do is jump the gun. You jump the gun and you don't have your ducks in a row. Not only does everybody look stupid, but then the the guilty often have the leeway and the loopholes to get away. Nobody wants that. Uh, I'm with uh, Jenny Price here. I have a million questions. One of the things, uh, Dr. Michaela and Steve mentioned this, you know, the 
husband of Jillian uh, Kelly has been very quiet. Um, it's a tough question to ask, but um, do you have to look at her family as well? I mean, you have to rule them out, right? Everybody. Yeah, you have to look at everybody. I'm um, in a case like this that everybody is a suspect until you can rule them out. Everybody. Yeah, Jen, I mean, what kind of trap do investigators run into? Because you guys are just human beings. I mean, if you look at the chat and the way we've been talking, everyone is kind of leaning, I think it's fair to say, towards grandma in some capacity and or Wrangler Cole Rickman, uh, the baby daddy. Uh, but what about looking at Jillian Kelly's family? We don't know what's going on with them. Um, we've seen plenty of stories where you have, you know, an all-American pastor, a God-fearing man. And I'm not saying this is a case at all, but don't we have to rule out that family as well? A hundred percent. You really have investigators looking at every prong. You have the possibility, although I think it's minute, I've said that, of the random attack. You have investigators that are going to be looking at Jillian Kelly's family. And then, of course, you have individuals looking at this custody dispute and all the family members involved in that. Um, where I would be really focusing on, uh, we talked about a historical timeline. I would go way back and I want to see when uh, the father was in prison. I want to see what those communications were. I would be listening, having those guards listen to every one of his telephone calls that he made because you don't listen to every telephone call. You only listen to them when you have a reason to listen because, again, it's manpower. I would have those calls listened to to see if any if there's any chatter about doing anything, because think about it. Who better where better of a place to find somebody to commit a crime like this than in prison? right? You might have individuals and people do crimes like this for a thousand dollars, two thousand uh, dollars. Many of them take very little money. I'm just saying this is a road I would be looking at is any associations he had in prison. Remember, he just got out. So I see a lot of timing issues that would make some sense. Uh, Ned Smith, I feel your pain. Is the guy's name Wrangler or is he a Wrangler? I thought he was a Wrangler with a W. Uh, because it's Oklahoma, and I, and his name was Cole Rickman, and I thought it was a Wrangler, Cole Rickman, but I found out Wrangler with a W is in fact his first name, Wrangler Cole Rickman. So it's one and the same, and it's not just an R; it is a W. So his name is Wrangler. Um, Zoot and Boo Z can grown adults like myself stop using words like baby daddy. It's ridiculous. I have to agree with you. It is kind of a ridiculous word, but it's kind of the phrase that people use now. Uh, you could say the father uh, of the kids, uh, Veronica Butler's, yeah, the father of her children. It's kind of easier to say baby daddy. So uh, ergo, I will continue to use the phrase baby daddy. Steve Peterson, one other thing I want to just touch on, and then we'll get uh, final thoughts here. And I brought it up earlier and that is, by the way, the fastest 90 minutes of your life just passed you by here. Um, both sides of the family here are alleging that the other side of the family was sexually abusing these two young children. So in some capacity, in many capacities, they are uh, the victims. But what is going on here and what do you have to do? Um, again, as an investigator, when one side is saying that Veronica Butler's brother is doing this, and Veronica Butler is saying that the Rickman side of the family is doing this. What do you, what do you do? How do you break that down? Well, you know, family court's a, a horrible beast. And the last thing you want to do is involve the court in your life. And you don't want the court dictating anything about your children. So look at the resources that exist out there. You've shown that picture of this desolate area, right? There's nobody around. So when it comes time for social services, what kind of services do they really have? What kind of foster homes do they have? Do they have people around that can do this? They may have very limited resources. And if one side of the family is saying, hey, we're safe, and, and there's no proof, allegations are simple. There's no proof that, they're, that the allegations are correct. You know, I think that more often than not, the court is going to side with keeping the kids in the family 
until they can prove that one side or the other doesn't deserve to have them. And maybe that's what this upcoming hearing would have proven. And mom would have got the kids back. You know, I, it's it's tough to say, but it, it just judging by the area, the population and, and what we know, I don't think the research, you know, I was reading about there's there's no newspapers in that area. They used to be, they sold them off. So there's no newspapers in, the, in that area. There's no media in that area. There's nobody to keep this story on the forefront except people like you, Joel. So, you know, it, it's easy for these things to die on the vine. It, it, the resources just aren't there. So I, I think that the, the court is limited in their options. And they, they try to do the best. I'd like to think and have some have some uh, uh, assumptions that the court is trying to do the right thing, have some faith in the court. Uh, I would like to think that there are always resources, but not necessarily the case. Again, this is a look at Jillian Kelly. Let's pray that she is safe. But as time passes, uh, you got to think that uh, she's uh, potentially in a lot of danger. Uh, that's Jillian Kelly. And then you've got Veronica Butler. By the way, there's been discussion over the color of her eyes. The OSBI called them green. The parents say they're blue. I'm going to stick with the OSBI until we get um, absolute con confirmation. Uh, Dr. Michaela. Uh, Sam Rosing, once again, joining us. We love having her. She is the owner of the largest Oklahoma-owned private investigation and process serving company. She's also um, not just a private investigator, uh, but a notary public and a licensed teacher and a principal and a superintendent licensed to do all of those things. Uh, Dr. Michaela, I had a question up and it is gone uh, in the wind, but your final thoughts here tonight um, where do you think this investigation needs to head from here? Well, like I said, I mean, I think that they uh, need to examine all the forensic and other evidence that I mentioned earlier. Uh, start with the family first and then spread out from, from there. I mean, find any uh, witnesses and, and you may even, well, I mean, so that's one thing that they can, that the OSBI can't do that we can is, I mean, as PIs, I mean, we can loosen tongues and we have other ways that we can do under, but they can't do uh, to do that. But uh, but I think that it's possible that they may have a lot po possibly um, in the works that they just haven't told us about the OSBI, uh, that is. And this could all come to light very soon, but it's also about a five hour trip each way there and back. So they don't have a lot of resources as it is. And it's, I know that's gonna be putting a strain on the OSBI's resources to be out there for very long. Um, again, I'd like to think that their uh, resources aren't strained, but especially in a, in a state that's as rural as this, it's, it's got to be. It's just difficult physically just to get from point A to point B because you've got to cover so much ground. A person who's excellent at covering investigative ground is Steve Peterson, a senior special agent retired um, with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Steve's a great investigator and help bust the real life Walter White of which Breaking Bad um, was created based on uh, that character. Uh, well, Steve Peterson nabbed the real guy. Steve, same question. Uh, what do investigators need to do tonight, tomorrow, and in the, you know, the coming days? I think they need to keep doing exactly what they've been doing. Focus on who they believe they have the best case on either eliminate those who they suspect who are not involved or focus on those that they can prove are. Only God knows what they retrieved from the vehicle in terms of evidence. None of us, none of us know. This is all speculation on our part. So we just pray that they, they find what they're looking for. They're able to bring this to a conclusion. It doesn't sound, I'm not very optimistic. It'll be a great conclusion, um, but I do, but I do have faith in them. And yeah, we're going to stay on this. If anything breaks, we will uh, bring it to you live. And a uh, special shout out to Laura Engel, who uh, I know is working really hard. She wanted to join, and we'll get her on the show uh, in the next couple of days once she's back to a place where there is sufficient cell service. Um, of course, got to say goodbye as well to Jennifer Koffendoffer, 28 years in federal law enforcement, even though she looks 28 years old today. <laughs> She uh, specialized in organized crime and violent crime, currently an expert witness for Eagle Security Group and a News Nation contributor. 
and she's got the new podcast called Break the Case with Jennifer Koffendoffer, FBI. Break the Case with Jennifer Koffendoffer. Jen, one of the questions that was asked was, uh, by this point, has the OSBI looked at everyone's cell phones that they need to look at and your final thoughts here? Okay, a couple of things. Yes and no. Yes, they have them on their target, but this is time intensive work. And you're also uh, at the mercy of the companies, of the cell companies. And so it takes time, even when you put exigent on that and you try to get your your uh, subpoenas, your warrants moved to the top. It's still uh, labor intensive work once you get the report. So that leads me to uh, really one of my final two statements. Number one, we are on, I think, day nine, something like that. Mm -hmm. They disappeared the 30th and, and, you know, we're just, you know, a week and a little out. This, it, it would be lightning speed unless they had something like the bodies, if there are bodies, to make a case. So we need to give investigators time, but I believe that they will crack this case. I think it's going to fall into place. They just need more time. Secondly, and, and maybe this is the most important, I'm just sick because of the kids. We're talking about allegations of two family members molesting them now. Uh, we're talking about a parent that is, you know, missing. Uh, geez, I, I, it just seems like the kids are, are really lost in the shuffle. And I, I feel horrible for these kids. I hope CPS, with all of this national attention put on this case, I hope they get in there. I hope they get evaluations done. They interview those kids. They look at their uh, environment. Oh. And they make some moves on this if, uh, you know, to make sure it, it, they're okay, even okay right now. Uh, and finally, Steve or, or Joel, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, I am a true friend of STS Nation. You do have amazing guests, and I always enjoy listening in and keep doing it. You're doing such a great job. Thank you, Jen Kavendopper. And you're one of those best guests. And uh, Cooper here, this is uh, perhaps the saddest part of the story that Jennifer was talking about. Breaks your heart that six children right now are without their moms and uh, hopefully they're reunited. But as you heard the expert investigators say, the chances of that are becoming more and more dim. If you have tips, 1-800-522-8017, 522 8017 Email tips at osbi.ok.gov. Tips at email uh, at OSBI. I'm sorry, tips at OSBI.ok.gov. Uh, appreciate this amazing panel. We will see you tomorrow morning uh, with the Crumbly's sentencing tomorrow night on Sebastian Rogers. We'll bring this to you if there are any breaking developments. Until then, love you, America. Love you, Nebraska. Love you, Hugoton, Kansas, Boston, and South Carolina, Florida, and of course, Kansas. And please keep both Jillian and Kelly and Veronica Butler uh, in your thoughts, and let's bring them back uh, in one piece. See you guys tomorrow. 